Hello. So, to continue my Prime Minister series, um, the following two figures that I'm going to talk about, Benjamin Disraeli and William York Gladstone, are without doubt two of the most um, famous 19th century statesmen. Um, and as with other prominent Prime Ministers such as Robert Peel, Robert Walpole, uh, and so forth and so on, it's highly likely that there'll be key pieces of information I'll inadvertently miss out. Uh, um, that's on intention, but it's, it's almost inevitable. Um, so I'm going to speak about Disraeli and Gladstone. I'm going to try and keep it quite compact. And in order to do so, I'll read directly from the Downing Street source, because that is a lot more compact than the Wikipedia source. Um, so this definitely heralds a cigar. Benjamin Disraeli our 29th Prime Minister. Um, Disraeli was quite an exceptional figure. Um, actually, just before this, I've been watching a documentary, which I've seen before, but I decided to just watch it, get myself in the frame of mind, um, called Disraeli and Gladstone Clash of the Titans. You cannot mention one without mentioning the other. It's presented by Hugh Edwards, and it's a very good documentary if you get a chance to watch it. Um, so that would be a good introduction to both men. Um, Benjamin Disraeli was born in 1804 in London. One thing that's interesting was he was actually uh, a little bit older than Gladstone. You know, we often remember Gladstone as the grand old man of Victorian politics, but Disraeli was actually slightly older. Um, and he was a Tory. He entered Parliament at, in, just get this right, he entered Parliament um, in the 1830s as a backbencher, and his maiden speech was actually widely ridiculed. Um, and at that time, he was seen as a bit of a dandy, he wasn't taken seriously, and it was widely ridiculed. There may have been anti Semitism played a role in this. Um, Israeli is also remembered as the only Jewish born British Prime Minister. Anti-Semitism was rife in Victorian Britain, and uh, I mean, if we look at the Jack the Ripper case, for example, in the 1880s, um, Jews were among the main suspects. It was anti-Jewish hysteria, it could be said. Um, and in his early parliamentary career, he had to put up with some truly shocking abuse. For example, in one of his first hustings, apparently, um, some uh, jobs, uh, as we would say today, put uh, meat or pork, to be specific, or on a spike in, and stuck it under his nose. So it really, really had to put up with some serious abuse. This was despite the fact at this point he was a practicing Anglican. His father had made that decision after falling out with local rabbis. So this really was actually a practicing Anglican, and he had to be in order to take up his seat. But that anti-Semitism was something that really was very, very obvious. And I think it's a mark of the man that he... Um, took it the way he did, with the courage that he did. Uh, whatever else you think of him, that, that cannot be denied. Um, he's really served twice as Prime Minister, uh, for, throughout 1868, and then for a longer period, from 1874 to 1880. Um, he succeeded um, in his first administration, the Earl of Derby. Um, as I say, in his first speech, that had went down really badly. So he realised he wanted to be seen as a political heavyweight. He had to find a way to do this. In order to do so, he took on Robert Peel um, and decided to lead a rebellion within the Tory party against the Horn Law repeal that Peel was pushing through. Um, and this was nothing to do with conviction. There's really, uh, it's believed, actually supported Peel on the argument but he wanted revenge because he felt that Peel should have promoted him and Peel didn't. So this was a rather vindictive attack on Peel. Um, that didn't go down too well. As Ken Clark points out in this documentary with Hugh Edwards, um, within the Conservative Party especially, those who stand up against the leader are not given a lot of uh, respect. Um, in other words, the assassins. That was very much the case of Michael Heseltine. Michael Heseltine was a very capable parliamentarian, but because he wielded the dagger on Margaret Thatcher, it backfired. So um, that's why Disraeli 
struggled for a bit at first. However, in the new administration of Lord Derby, it was Derby soon realised that although he didn't like this really personally speaking, um, he found him uh, to be the most capable minister in his cabinet. Um, he served no fewer than three occasions as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, briefly, in 1852, then 1858 to 1859, and finally 1866 to 1868. And he was a formidable Chancellor. Um, he was the leader of the opposition on two occasions. And whilst I pointed out that in uh, Victoria's early reign, there was that shuffle between Derby and Russell, um, it's the Victorian period is most remembered for this rivalry between Disraeli and Gladstone. The two men first met each other in 1835, at a joint dinner arranged by a Lord uh, Long, Longfleet, Longleat, I think. Um, so they'd known each other for a long time and it was an instant dislike. They had very different personalities. But I'm going to go straight into um, the Downing Street article now. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies and statistics. That's from Disraeli. He's also quoted with this famous saying, perhaps more famous than that one, I have reached the top of the greasy pole. Uh, so he's basically making a statement that politics is corrupt, always has been and always will be. Politician, novelist and bon viveur, Benjamin Disraeli was a man of many interests, but it was a conservative politician that it was as a conservative politician that Disraeli achieved lasting fame. He was a one nation Tory and um, he very much promoted the principle um, of imperialism in the sense that he most associated the Conservative Party with the British Empire, even more than Palmerston had as a Whig. So that's something that's um, worth noting. Um, he was not only a dominant statesman in Britain, he became a very dominant statesman in Europe. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, he was a novelist of mediocre success. He published uh, one novel that's achieved some acclaim, that was Sybil. Um, but throughout his time as Prime Minister, he initiated a wide range of legislation to improve educational opportunities in the life of working people. This is incredible for a Conservative Prime Minister by today's standards. Uh, Benjamin Dizzy Disraeli uh, was the son of Isaac, a Jewish Italian writer, and had an Anglican upbringing from the age of 12. Um, with Jews excluded from Parliament until 1858, this enabled Disraeli to follow a career that otherwise would have denied him. Age 20, he lost money by gambling on the stock exchange and helped launch the representative and newspaper intended to usurp the Times, but it soon failed in that regard. He went on to produce an anonymously written satirical novel, Vivian Gray, which caricatured a former business partner. Success, however, turned to slander when his authorship was revealed. The stress caused by this and by his continuing debts drove him to suffer a nervous breakdown. I didn't actually realise that until just reading that now. Um, he was elected to represent Maidstone as a Peelite in 1837, despite mocked, well, uh, I've made this come, uh, I, I've made that point that he was mocked in his first speech. But when he sat down, he said, the time will come when you hear me. Um, so he started to be taken more seriously after that. He was elected to Shrewsbury in 1841 and began to be renowned as a very witty and capable parliamentarian. Um, after keeping his resentment private for a time, he attacked Peel bitterly over his decision to repeal the Corn Laws, eventually forcing the resignation of Peel's government in 1846. Um, he served under Lord Derby, um, but his December budget was torn to pieces by Gladstone. And of course, this probably was a big part in their mutual hatred of one another. Um, after Derby's resignation in 1868, Queen Victoria invited Disraeli to become Prime Minister and they soon struck up a remarkable rapport thanks to Disraeli's charm and skillful flattery. He was said to be a bit of a ladies' man, incidentally. Um, he was there to tell a colleague who had asked for advice on how to handle the Queen, first of all, remember she is a woman. Uh, that indicates Disraeli's attitude to um, dealing with the fairer sex, I guess you could say. On um, finally achieving his long addition, Disraeli declared I've climbed to the top of the greasy pole. Apologies for repeating myself here. After defeat by the Liberals at the Jets, and then, excuse me, the next election, his position as Conservative leader was at risk. His health was poor and his wife died in 1872. 
prompting them to write, I am totally only able to meet the catastrophe. But he carried on. Then they met Disraeli, uh, sorry, then they met Gladstone across the dispatch box. And it became Britain's most famous parliamentary rivalry. The contrast in their physical appearances and their t- styles is stark. Um, I mean, there was different in so many ways. Um, for example, Disraeli was quite flamboyant. He had a top hat. He was charming. He was funny. Um, Gladstone was very solemn. Uh, very, very, very different styles. Um, and Gladstone, incidentally, if you don't mention it in the Gladstone video, was on popular with Queen Victoria. She once said that he addressed her like he addressed a public meeting. Um, Disraeli became Prime Minister again in 1874 at the age of 70, uh, becoming the second oldest Prime Minister on ascension, on ascension that is, after Palmerston. And this was seen as the largely successful premiership, though it has been said that the legislation of this time depended much less upon Dizzy and himself than his cabinet colleagues. So perhaps he's given on due uh, credit for that. Although this premiership saw the passing of a large number of social legislation, the 1875 Climbing Boys Act reinforced the ban on employing juvenile chimney sweeps. The 1875 Artisans Dwelling Act allowed local authorities to destroy slums, although this was voluntary, and provided housing for the poor. The same year, the Public Health Act provided sanitation, such as running water and refuse disposal. And being made the Earl of Beakersfield by Victoria in 1879, was really governed from the House of Lords. Foreign policy increasingly became important, especially the Eastern question following Turkish atrocities against the Bulgarians. Um, the 1880 election was lost to the Liberals, a narrow loss in terms of vote, ca- vote cast. He really threw himself into the job of opposition and was active until a month before his death from bronchitis in April 1881. And on his deathbed, he is reported to have said, I had rather live, but I am not afraid to die. Um, there's simply so much in Disraeli's life uh, that it's difficult to address everything here. Many world events happened during his time in office. Um, he worked at the Congress of Berlin, for example, which is an infamous, uh, arguably infamous, um, meeting to maintain peace at the Balkans. And also, um, I believe it was the Congress of Berlin that established um, European powers in Africa who would take what colonies. Although I may be mistaken in that. But I believe that was at that same Congress of Berlin. Um, what else can I say about this really? I'm trying to keep this compact. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, important events during this time. Controversial wars in Af- uh, Afghanistan and South Africa uh, underpinned his, undermined, excuse me, his public support. Um, he angered British farmers by refusing to reinstate the corn laws in response to poor harvest and cheap American grain. Um, I should say that um, at this time. It's an observation that the public was much more in support of foreign war wars than they would be today. So, for example, the Zulu War, um, the First Boer War, these sort of conflicts, the Anglo-Sikh Wars, were a lot more popular than the sort of foreign wars today. In other words, I believe had Tony Blair been prime minister at the time, he would have been very popular. Uh, this was the height of empire, of course. Um, in the east of Europe, there was threats from that from the Russian Empire. Um, so, you know, it was a very, very eventful time, but I'll dust it up there for Disraeli. Needless to say, he's been featured in media very often. He's featured in Family Guy. Ironically, the quip was that he was, um, you don't even know who I am, uh, Peter Griffin, sort of, um, it's a segment with Peter Griffin. That's ironic because he's one of our most famous prime ministers. Um, his grave at uh, Tuffenden. His estate in Buckinghamshire is quite, uh, the local parish there is quite, stands out quite a bit. It's got blue railings. That's where the Disraeli family rests. Um, like I say, he was older than Gladstone and he died a full 18 years before Gladstone. He was 76 when he died. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more I can say. Um, one more thing, he uh, was responsible for helping to create Queen Victoria as Empress of India. 
during her Golden Jubilee in 1887. Um, and like I say, he was very close to the Queen. She was very fond of him. Um, he was featured in a lot of satire. Um, yeah, there really is a lot I can say about this, really. There's one uh, piece of satire here I'm just looking at showing Lord Randolph Churchill in 1886 with the ghost of Disraeli overshadowing him. There's a statue of Disraeli in Parliament Square. Um, he's known for Vivian Gray and Sybil, but he did write other books as well. Um, and he's remembered in a lot of, I uh, can't think of any films off the top of my head, but um, yep, that's Benjamin Disraeli. So um, no doubt I will have forgotten something there, but there's a lot to say about him.